Welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, your home for an honest, straightforward, and personal discussion about anti-anxiety drugs, their effects, and how to deal with dependence and withdrawal. Whether you have taken benzodiazepines, Z drugs, or any other tranquilizers, know someone who has, or you just want help dealing with chronic anxiety and insomnia, this is your podcast. I'm your host, D.E. Foster, author of the book, Benzo Free, The World of Anti-Anxiety Drugs and the Reality of Withdrawal. I'm so glad you joined us today. Please stick around and let me bend your ear for a few minutes. It just might feel a little better on the other side. Well, hello there. This is Dee, and welcome to Episode 17 of the Benzo Free Podcast. It is so good to be talking with you today. I mean, it really is. I am in a good mood. Life is good. No, life is amazing. There is so much to be thankful for, and I am so grateful to be alive. That's right. I feel damn good. Now, you might be sitting there listening to the podcast wondering, why is Dee telling me this? This isn't what I want to hear. And there's a reason for it. So just hang with me for a second, okay? As most of you know, I was on Clonopin for over 12 years. Now, after that, I tapered for about a year and a half. And then for four years, I was in acute and protracted withdrawal, struggling almost every day. And right now, I feel damn good. I had some really bad years in there. But I found that rainbow on the other side. You know, this past weekend, my wife Shanna and I were cleaning off our patio for spring, which includes our pergola. It's that wooden structure that covers the patio. And, and we have to weave these canvas strips in and out between the rungs, um, these strips that she made to help give us some shade. Your host, D, um, this proverbial redhead <laughs> who has the palest, whitest skin <laughs> in the world, you know, just doesn't like the sun too much. <laughs> he loves to be outside, but he does need his shade. So we put those up there and clean off our patio furniture and everything. We get it ready for spring. Anyway, to clean off the dirt and grime on top of the pergola has always been my wife's job. Primarily because, well, I had a fear of heights. My mild fear of heights that I had before, you know, I went through withdrawal became incredibly escalated during withdrawal. And I was afraid, you know, to go up a ladder beyond, you know, four or five feet. But getting up on that ladder this weekend not a problem. Without even thinking about it, I was standing on the top step of our ladder, spraying down the pergola to clean it all off. Now, that's not the wisest move in the world, I know, but that's not the point. The point is, I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid in a spot that I was very afraid in just a year or two ago. It was a telltale sign of my healing. So when I opened up the podcast with how good I'm feeling, The purpose is that I want to let you know I'm healing. I'm doing well. Like I've said a thousand times before, you get better. You do heal. You get through this. And if you're really struggling, please hang on to that message and remember that. My life, yeah, I still have down days and I still am going to struggle. I know I've shared that with you several times. My emotions now just flow freely, as I mentioned to you in the last episode. But you know what? I'm not afraid of them. I'm not anymore. I let them come and I let them go. I process them, but I don't let them knock me down. I just let them pass and I move on. This thing called benzo withdrawal, it sucks. We know that. But it is temporary. And I know I've said that a lot, but it is temporary. And when you come out that other side, because of the tools, because of what I've learned, because of what I've been through, Life is better for me, at least, than it's ever been before. I have a new outlook. I have these new tools. I have a new philosophy of life. I'm here talking to you because I want to share this with you every day and let you know that, guess what? You're going to get through this, too, and I can't wait to see you when you do. We're going to have a party, (laughs) and it's going to be fun. (laughs) It, It truly is heartening to know that there are people all around the world, many of whom are in distress and have been for months or years. 
And some of those people have found comfort in my voice. <laughs> that blows my mind. And much of the content in our podcast and blog aren't mine. A lot of our content comes from ideas and other posts like BIC, WBAT, and others, and some comes from scientific journals, but most of it comes from you, the listeners, and the readers of the blog. Without you, I wouldn't know what the hell to talk about, which it may seem like sometimes when I do my intro as I ramble on, you know, like now, you know, or not know what I'm going to say next as I'm just meandering here through <laughs> thoughts in my head. <laughs> anyway... I wanted to let you know that we've surpassed 3,000 downloads of the podcast now and in 52 countries, and that's pretty cool to me. I am really excited about those numbers. And it's not about the numbers, and it's not about the success of Benzo Free. It's about reaching people who are hurting. That's really why I do this, and that's really why I keep going, and it's really why I spend so much time. My God, if we're helping just one of you, and I know we're doing more than that, then this is worth it. It's all worth it. Almost 90% of our listeners are in five countries. That's the U.S., Canada, Australia, U.K., and Sweden. That is our base, and I am amazed that so many people in these countries have tuned in to listen to this and have found some solace or comfort or information in our podcast. I am just really grateful for that solid base of listeners. Thank you. And as I've mentioned many times before, we also get people listening from all around the world. And you know what? I've mentioned the countries that we reach before, but now that we've reached 52 countries, I think we should update that real quick. Let me just mention the 19 new countries that I haven't mentioned yet on a previous episode, if you don't mind. I just kind of want to reach out and say, welcome. You know, welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, and I hope this isn't the only episode you listen to. I hope you come back and you find comfort and find a friend, and find information, and find something that helps you get through this time in your life. Our new countries include Afghanistan, Algeria, Argentina, Austria, Barbados, Belgium, Chile, Colombia, Congo, Croatia, Dominican Republic, Greece, Italy, Japan, Mauritius, Peru, Sierra Leone, Slovenia, in Spain. So welcome to the Benzo Free Podcast, and I'm really glad you're here. Please drop me a line and say hello. Just go to our feedback form or send me an email. Let me know you're there. Let me know you listened and let me know what you think. Now, for those of you who are waiting for another interview, please don't fret. They are coming. I have one scheduled to record in May, which should be very enlightening. In fact, I think it might even be a two-parter. I'm excited about this one. And I already have a few others lined up for late May and in June, so they're just around the corner, so hang in there. In the meantime, though, I am happy to keep you occupied by my singing. Psych. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. <laughs> Trust me, it's not something you want to hear. Now, let me talk to you a bit about episode length. As some of you have noticed, each episode of the podcast has been getting longer and longer. Uh, when I exported the audio file for last week's episode, it was over an hour long. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't release that one. So I went back and cut out a few small sections to bring it down to 59 minutes. <laughs> Still, that felt really long. This growing length of each episode was not intentional. It just, you know, kind of happened. I think the best length for our podcast is probably around 40 to 45 minutes. And I'm, I'm going to try to keep things more consistent at that time frame going forward. Part of the reason for this is an attempt to manage my workload, honestly. I still get overwhelmed sometimes and bend so free. Well, it, it does take a lot of time. I am in this for the long haul, so I want to manage my health in the process. And I am still healing, so I sometimes have to take that into consideration. And in our attempt to shorten our length a bit, some of our sections might not be part of the format every episode, but instead will be included periodically as needed. Also, I'm going to cut my travelogue before each Benzo story. <laughs> you know, I, I think it's more for my benefit than anyone else's when I put that in. And, and it might not generate the right mood as a lead-in for some of these, well, very emotional stories. I just don't know if it's appropriate anymore, so I'm going to drop that for a while. 
Thus, our format today is going to include our introduction, our mailbag, Benzo News, Benzo Stories feature, and our moment of peace. We're going to drop the spotlight just for this week. Don't worry, it will return periodically as we have another organization or website or film to cover. But for right now, we're going to drop it out of, out of this episode today. And as with all these changes, please let me know what you think. This is your podcast and you have a say. Our feature today is Benzo Brain. Cognitive Dysfunction and Memory Loss in Withdrawal. This is part of our ongoing series on the symptoms of withdrawal. In case you are new to the series, please check out episode number 8, titled An Introduction to Benzo Withdrawal Symptoms. This provides an overview of all these symptoms and is a good precursor to the series. And of course, before I close out the intro, as you guessed it, we need what? What do we need? (laughs) <laughs> feedback. Good. You're right. How did you know that one? Questions, comments, stories, suggestions, corrections. What you had for lunch. Yes, last week we did breakfast. Today we're doing lunch. This is your podcast. And the more content I can share from you, the more Benzo Free becomes this community that, that, that I want it to be and I hope you want it to be. So please tell us what you think. Visit our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback or email us at podcast at benzofree.org. And don't forget to sign up for our mailing list at benzofree.org slash subscribe. And you know what? Please remember that the Benzo Free podcast is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. And if you are listening to this podcast on one of our providers, please leave feedback on that carrier. This helps new listeners find us. Let's move on. And that brings us to our mailbag section. In an effort to keep it brief, we're going to only have one question today. So let's take a look at it. This one is from Kathy in Colorado, USA. Kathy asks, are my GABA receptors healing during titration? That's a great question, Kathy. Thank you for that one. And the answer to that is yes, I sure think so. But let me explain. Remember when we talked about homeostasis? When we started taking the drugs, our bodies had to adjust to find a new balance. The drugs bombarded our GABA receptors with calming signals, so homeostasis kicked in to rebalance and thus downregulated our GABA receptors. During titration or any form of taper, we begin to provide less drug to our body. The balance becomes unbalanced again, and homeostasis tries to correct itself one more time. The big struggle is that this doesn't happen overnight. For many of us, it can take months, even years. Now, We're only talking about GABA receptors here right now. Remember, even though our GABA receptors get all the press, it seems, in the benzo community and appear to be a significant factor of physiological dependence and withdrawal, it is by no means the only mechanism affected. Other effects of benzos on our bodies include dopamine production, our endocrine system, CRF concentrations, hyperventilation syndrome, mitochondria, and the learning deficit Ashton even talks about. This is complex stuff, but it's stuff that's good to know. We'll dedicate an upcoming episode to the science of benzos and physiological dependence. Trust me, it it will be fun. (laughs) We're going to make it fun. (laughs) I hope that helped answer your question, Kathy, and and thanks for sending it to us. And that closes our mailbag today, keeping it brief, and we're going to move on to Benzo News. Here are the news highlights from last week, the week of April 28th, 2019. On Monday, the Austin Benzo Withdrawal Group posted a short and effective video from Tech Insider titled, What Happens to Your Brain When You Take Xanax? Unfortunately, as one of our readers pointed out, this video did use the term addiction inappropriately in the video, and that is a correction we wanted to note. Also on Monday, Bick reposted a 2018 article from Nicole Lamberson titled, Why Prescribed Benzo Patients Shouldn't Go to Detox or Rehab? It was a vital warning about the dangers of rapid detox from benzos. On Wednesday, we released episode 16 of the podcast titled, The Assault on Our Senses, Benzo Withdrawal Symptoms of the Eyes, Ears, Nose, and Mouth. This was part four in our 14-part ongoing series of the symptoms of benzo withdrawal. On Thursday, EMPR.com published an article on the new FDA warning for Z-drugs titled, FDA, boxed warning, contraindication added to several insomnia medications. This was in relation to accidents and deaths related to complex sleep behavior. 
On Friday, Health Europa published an article titled, Newly Uncovered Gene Mutation Has the Ability to Reduce Fear and Anxiety. This study found a gene in mice which may be a key to managing anxiety in humans. On Saturday, I wrote a blog post titled, The Missing Message, New FDA Boxed Warning for Z-Drugs. In this op-ed, I shared the warning from the FDA, but also commented on the lack of coverage on withdrawal complications in media. And that's it for our news. You can see all our posts on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash benzofree. And please, if you know of any other great articles or news that you would like us to cover, tell us. And from anywhere around the world, we're always looking for news about benzos, dependence, recovery, anxiety, insomnia, whatever you have. We want to hear it. Let's move on to our benzo story. Today I have a story from Nancy in England. Nancy shares, Hi D. I have just finished listening to the latest podcast. I look forward to receiving my email each week to say it's available to listen to. I really enjoy them and thank you for being a voice for us all. So I finished my diazepam taper on the 23rd of March, just over two weeks ago. I have various symptoms, brain fog, some dizzy spells, nausea, insomnia, fatigue, inner trembling in the mornings, UTI-type systems with no UTI, pelvic pain with nothing found on scan, and a few more aches and pains. I have to say some of these are improving, although, like everyone else going through this, we don't like to say something is feeling a bit better in, in case we jinx it and it gets worse. I was interested in the feature today as it was about the psychological symptoms. I was put on diazepam for anxiety like many other people. Since the taper got down low and post-withdrawal, the anxiety is off the chart, and I have also developed some agoraphobia. I try to get out for a walk every day, and if I'm not too spaced out with the head symptoms, I'll drive to the supermarket for a few bits. I, I do this to make sure I get out. I have isolated myself, putting off visits from friends and family, and I do not visit them either. I am alone all day as my husband works. He is my support, I suppose. He cooks and makes sure I eat. He finds it hard sometimes. It must be so stressful for him. Anyway, I, I wanted to mention depression. I have never known anything like it. I have had low mood in the past, but this is off the scale. It's such a hopeless time. Y you feel it will never end. I cry so much I have bags under my eyes you could carry your shopping in. I have very negative, looping thoughts. I, I am not suicidal, but often feel like I can't go on, it, if that makes sense. There are two Monday to Friday Benzo support organizations who I can call every day if need be. They are very reassuring and tell me everything I am experiencing is normal. This all feels so far from normal. They say these psychological symptoms will pass, and they say I am in acute withdrawal. How long does that last? We don't know. Everyone is different. I don't have any anger issues, luckily. I hope I don't get them anyway. Although, I have noticed that when you read something out, you always say quote and unquote. That irritates me. Ha ha. I am hoping that soon I can start to rebuild my life, which is very small at the moment and very unpleasant. Maybe you could do a podcast on success stories. I would love to hear some. It would give me hope and some inspiration. Maybe there's a song in there somewhere. Thank you for setting up Benzo Free, and I love the podcasts. You have a very calming voice. Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. I I really appreciate your story. And as you might have noticed, I have stopped saying quote and end quote. So don't worry, it, it kind of irritated me too. I am so glad that you have some support organizations in the UK. I, I know these are local and not available internationally, but it's groups like these which can really make a difference. Just being able to call someone and talk to a real person about what you're going through, that is a big help. The isolation can be difficult. I, I'm sorry that is a struggle of yours. Thanks again. Please take care and keep in touch. 
And don't forget, we still need stories, short ones, long ones, success stories, unsuccessful stories, stories of mermaids and dragons. I don't care. <laughs> well, only if the mermaids and dragons took benzos, I guess. <laughs> okay, I just had a thought. Can you imagine a dragon <laughs> in benzo withdrawal? <laughs> anyway, I digress. Sorry. <laughs> Just go to our feedback form on benzofree.org slash feedback to share your story or send me an email at podcast at benzofree.org. And you know what? Don't forget, you can also submit your story in your own voice. Instructions on how to do that are on our feedback page. Let's go on to our feature. Today, our feature topic is Benzo Brain, Cognitive Dysfunction and Memory Loss in Withdrawal. This is the fifth installment of our 14-part ongoing series on symptoms of benzo withdrawal. It, you know, I, re I realize this is a long series, but there's a lot to cover in, in this subject, and that's why I broke it down into several episodes. So I, I hope you're finding it useful. Today we're going to focus on cognitive issues. These include cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, and intrusive memories. We're going to spend most of our time on cognitive dysfunction and memory, but first let's touch on intrusive memories. Now, some of you might wonder what are intrusive memories? Are the same things as intrusive thoughts or other stuff like that? And they're slightly different. Intrusive memories can be traumatic events from someone's past um, or even a, a vivid memory of another person they haven't seen or thought about for years. Intrusive memories are common with people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD. These, these can range from mildly distressing memories to all-out flashbacks where the person feels like they have returned to the scene of a traumatic event. You see, all benzodiazepines and Z-drugs suppress memory. They produce what is called a transient amnesic effect on the explicit memory system. And this is characterized by impaired episodic memory. In a study published in Psychiatric Investigation in 2013, the researchers evaluated lorazepam and its effect on intrusive memories. They were seeking an anti-intrusive drug to treat PTSD patients. This study found that lorazepam had an effect on suppressing intrusive memories, but that further research was needed. Thus, it would follow that if the use of benzodiazepines such as lorazepam can suppress intrusive memories, then the withdrawal of these same drugs may lead to the return or even the creation of new memories. Professor Ashton says the following in the Ashton Manual. A fascinating symptom in patients undergoing benzodiazepine withdrawal is that they often mention the occurrence of what seem to be intrusive memories. Their minds will suddenly conjure up a vivid memory of someone they had not thought about or seen for years. Sometimes the other person's face will appear when looking in the mirror. The interesting thing about these memories is that they often start to occur at the same time that vivid dreams appear. These may be delayed until one or more weeks after the dosage tapering has started. Ashton and others have theorized that this is linked to dreaming. Since benzos affect REM sleep and often prevent dreaming during their use, this could be a sign of healing, and, and that normal dreaming is starting to return. While these symptoms can be incredibly frightening, it can help to look at the symptom as a return of normal functioning. Dreams are coming back, and with them might be some unwanted, disturbing thoughts. If you have a story about intrusive memories, especially with benzodiazepine withdrawal, let us know. I would be happy to share it on the podcast. Let's move on to cognitive dysfunction and memory loss. Cognitive effects of benzodiazepines have garnered concern since they were first available in 1960. Professor Malcolm Later warned of possible brain damage in long-term benzo patients early on. Unfortunately, his alarms fell on mostly deaf ears. In February of last year, 2018, there was a study published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine by doctors Jeffrey Gina and Brian Merrill of Wright State University in Ohio. The title of this study is Benzodiazepines 1, Upping the Care on Downers, the Evidence of Risks, Benefits, and Alternatives. 
The doctors researched over 108 studies on benzodiazepines and provided their review of the evidence. Within this review, there's a section titled Cognitive, Emotional, and Behavioral Adverse Effects. I'd like to share a section of that here. And just so you know, when the author says the term BZD, some of you might not know that that means benzodiazepines. The authors wrote the following. Mental health patients commonly have inattention and amnesia. Therefore, it is particularly disturbing that cognitive impairments are among the adverse effects caused by BZDs. While cognitive effects can occur as part of BZD intoxication, withdrawal, or delirium, they can also occur as a direct effect of BZDs. Cognitive impairments are more common with high doses and or long-term use of BZDs, but can also be caused by low doses, short-term use, and even single daily doses, especially in the elderly. While the most common cognitive adverse effects of BZDs, sedation and drowsiness, often improve as tolerance develops, many cognitive impairments persist with continued use. The authors of this review mentioned that these symptoms may be mistaken for unrelated progressive dementia or Alzheimer's. We talked about this possible misdiagnosis in Senior Week in some of our blog posts. The review stated, Elderly patients often attribute memory problems to age rather than BZDs. And about 10% of elderly patients referred to memory clinics have cognitive impairments that are substance-induced, often due to BZDs. This means that as many as 10% or even more of patients who have been diagnosed with dementia or Alzheimer's disease may just be experiencing the side effects of benzos. And with proper management and withdrawal, they may be able to return their mental faculties. But if they don't have this information, they may never know. Cognitive dysfunction and memory impairment are quite common side effects of benzodiazepine use. I think anybody who is dealing with this right now gets this and understands this. And it's one of the last ones to heal. Episodic memory, which is memory of recent events, is most commonly affected, while some other memory functions may not be impaired at all. You see, benzodiazepines can cause anterograde amnesia, which is the loss of the ability to create new memories after a specific event. So, if you take a short-acting benzo before a medical procedure, your ability to create a memory of that event is hindered and you will have limited recollection of any uncomfortable events during the procedure. Now, this is great for events such as intrusive medical tests, but not so great in everyday life. Whether the short-term cognition and memory issue gets better or worse in the long term has been in debate, but some studies are starting to clear the waters. In 2004, a meta-analysis reviewed 13 small studies on benzodiazepines and found that long-term use was associated with moderate to severe adverse effects in all areas of cognition, with impairment to IQ, information processing, visual motor coordination, verbal learning and concentration, and most of all, visual spatial memory. Now, the subjects in the study were all from withdrawal clinics, so concurrent psychiatric issues and withdrawal complications might have limited its applicability. In the 1990s, the benzodiazepine triazolam, which went by the brand name Halcyum, was removed from the United Kingdom market. Allegations claimed that the drug caused severe psychiatric side effects, including paranoia, hallucinations, and excitability. Some patients have even claimed to have blackout episodes while on these benzos. These, these are periods of time when the person has no recollection of what happened or how he or she got there. There are even cases where defendants in courtrooms have claimed that benzodiazepines have caused their criminal activities, including murder. And that makes you wonder if in the 1990s the UK removed Halcyon from their market, what about the rest of benzodiazepines? 
Is Halcyon really that different? And what about for the rest of us? What effect are these really having on our cognitive abilities? Let's take a look at the risk factors for developing cognitive dysfunction during benzodiazepine use. According to the review by Gina and Merrill, factors include older age, especially persistent use after 50 years old, other substance use, especially alcohol, other NCDs, especially TBI, delirium in which even very low doses of BZDs may be intoxicating, longer use, and primary psychiatric disorders like PTSD, psychotic, depressive, and bipolar disorders. Many doctors prescribe benzos as what's called a bridge drug, and this is supposedly to carry over the patient until they can start therapy or some other treatment. But according to some studies, especially in the treatment of PTSD, cognitive effects decrease the effectiveness of psychotherapy. So putting these patients on benzodiazepines short-term as a bridge option actually reduces the effectiveness of the therapy. The effects among people suffering PTSD, such as veterans, are particularly disturbing. PTSD is already a risk factor for developing dementia, and the use of benzos only makes it more complicated and quite often worse. In fact, the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs recommends against the use of benzodiazepines for the treatment of PTSD. Despite this recommendation, 30% of VA PTSD patients had a prescription for benzos in the fiscal year of 2012. While the creation of memories about everyday life seem hindered by benzos, they appear not to affect certain memory, like semantic memory, language, or retrieval from long-term memory stores. And much like the elderly, children can be especially at risk for cognitive dysfunction. At the annual meeting of the International Anesthesia Research Society in 2016, it was reported that a study performed at Vanderbilt University Medical Center found that age, severity of illness, and benzodiazepine exposure are the strongest predictors of delirium in critically ill children. Delirium is quite common in children with severe illness, and benzos have been found to make it worse. Dr. Heidi Smith, a pediatric anesthesiologist, said the following. This is a poignant realization because currently the foundation of sedation in the pediatric ICU setting is benzodiazepine administration. Understanding the relationship between benzodiazepine exposure with delirium and long-term cognitive outcomes in children is paramount. As with all things benzos, children and the elderly are at high risk. Now let's take a look at cognitive dysfunction and withdrawal. A couple of studies in 1994 provided some you know, interesting information. The first study, published in International Clinical Psychopharmacology, found that many benzo patients were cognitively impaired 10 months after withdrawal, as compared to control groups. In fact, many users complained that it took years before their previous mental capacity returned. The second study published in Psychological Medicine detailed similar effects, and it said, The main cognitive functions assessed in this study include working memory, verbal learning and memory, visual motor, and visual conceptual skills. The lack of evidence for clinically significant cognitive recovery raises concern about the severity and reversibility of any underlying BZ-induced organic impairment. And there have been other studies, too. Some Swedish studies have discovered that intellectual impairment, although improved, was still present four to six years after cessation. Still, according to most studies, cognition usually recovers after discontinuation. But this can be a very slow process. Many people in protracted withdrawal admit that cognitive dysfunction and anxiety are the last two symptoms to return to normal. You know, as, as many of you know, I'm still basically unemployed. <laughs> now, th that doesn't mean I'm idle, not by a long shot. I, I spend about 50 hours a week on BenzoFree with the website, blog, podcast, and ongoing correspondence. But, but as for paid employment, well, that's where things went south during, during my withdrawal. 
You see, I, I ended my last two database contracts, as I may have mentioned earlier, because of my inability to perform well enough mentally in the job. In the high-stress technical field of information technology, you got to be on the ball, and you got to be able to keep up. And I always used to be able to. My difficulties with memory and cognitive functioning made it hard for me to keep pace. I would go to work and I could still program in my own database language, the one that I really knew well and the one that I was hired to work on. But there were always new programs or applications you needed to learn to work in different scenarios and settings. And I couldn't learn these. I would have to take copious amounts of notes and just try to hammer them into my brain. And I would refer to the notes all the time, but I couldn't grasp the new technology. I couldn't make the new memories. The old ones were still there, but I couldn't make the new ones. I haven't tried the database work again in a while. And I don't know that I want to, to be honest. I am, I'd like to keep doing what I'm doing here. But I wonder if all that's back now, or part of it, or if I'm still where I was a year or two ago. My mental struggles still irritate me now and then, and I still come and go a bit, but I know I'm, I'm better. I think I'm significantly better than I was. I could probably return to database work, but honestly, I hope I don't have to. I'm, I'm working on ways of making this my new career and staying focused on the podcast and the blog and writing more and writing other books. That's where I want to be, and that's that's my passion, and I'm so glad that I was able to discover that during this difficult period. But there are also bills, and that's an unfair burden to put on my wife to maintain. I need to do my share, and I'm going to figure that out. So how, how do you deal with this, and how do we manage this cognitive memory dysfunction? You know, I... I believe the best thing you can do to maintain your cognitive function during withdrawal is to keep using your brain. Stay as mentally active as you can during withdrawal. It's like the old use it or lose it rule. Learn a new skill or hobby, take a class, read, study a new language, do crossword puzzles, word searches, Sudoku, whatever rocks your boat. Working on Benzo Free was a saving grace for me. For you, it's going to be different. What is it? Find that or find multiple things. But keep your mind active. Keep it active. Physical activity is also just as important. Exercise provides oxygen-rich blood to your brain, which keeps it energized, growing, and healing. you got to let the brain heal. I don't mean you have to push yourself hard, especially when you're having a bad day, but do what you can. Even a 10-minute walk can make a huge difference. You know, keeping socially active with your family and friends can also help. It, it's your brain, and it's trying to repair itself. Give it all the help you can. It, it needs help. Oh, you know, as I close this out, I think this is a really hard one. I mean, who are we if we lose our mind? And so many of us feel like we lose our mind. Whether it's from cognitive dysfunction, memory loss, or it's combined with derealization and depersonalization and intrusive memories and everything else bombarding you and increasing anxiety and depression. All these things work together and make it hopeless at times. Or at least it feels that way, and I understand that. I wish I had the magical answer for you. I really do. But unfortunately, the magical answer is time. And having the patience to wait for the time to heal what you're going through, that's the hard struggle. But you can do it. I know you can. I opened this episode telling you how good I'm doing. And I am doing good. Yes, I still struggle with all kinds of stuff. Right now, as I'm recording this, my tinnitus in my right ear is bugging the hell out of me. But I'm moving on and I'm ignoring it. And guess what? It'll probably fade away in a few minutes. Only to come back another day. 
Cognitive dysfunction and memory loss is like any other symptom in withdrawal. Getting over it is a combination of healing and acceptance. And if you find a blend of that, the balance of that that works for you, over time, you're going to start to feel better, as I did. And maybe like me, you might come out of this thing better than you were when you went in. I can honestly say that's where I'm at. And it's damn good. Thanks for listening to me today. Now let's listen to our disclaimer. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered medical advice in any way. The host of this podcast is not a medical professional, nor is he engaged in rendering medical, health, or psychological advice, nor any other kind of personal professional services. The views and opinions expressed by our listeners and interview guests on this podcast, whether read from textual submissions or presented in their own voice, do not necessarily reflect those of the Benzo Free Podcast or of its host. Withdrawal tapering or any other change in dosage of benzodiazepines, non-benzodiazepines, or any other prescription drugs should only be done under the direct supervision of a licensed physician. Our full disclaimer can be viewed on our website at benzofree.org slash disclaimer. And that brings us to our closing, our moment of peace. It's just one minute, and it's an opportunity to quiet your mind a bit before you return to the chaos of the real world. The way this works is that I will give you a brief introduction, a suggestion, or something to focus on. Then I'll play a soft bell, which will indicate the start of the one minute. This will be followed by another soft bell, which will indicate the end of the one minute. And that will be the end of the episode. Feel free to continue to meditate if you choose, or if not, continue on with your day. Please remember that if you are driving or operating heavy machinery or in any place which is not safe to close your eyes and meditate, then please skip this close or wait until you are in a safe location to do the exercise. Today we are going to do a counting meditation. This one is quite simple and it gives your mind something active to focus on. It's quite simple, actually. On the in-breath, say to yourself, one. On the out-breath, count two. On the in-breath, count three. And so on. When you reach ten, you can start over again. If you lose your place or your mind wanders, just start back at one again. Remember not to judge yourself at all. If you never reach ten, that is okay. Just start again and keep counting. It doesn't matter how far you get. The counting is no different from any other mantra. It's just a thought to focus on. Let's get started. Close your eyes and relax. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly. Let's do that again. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. And let it out slowly along with all the stress of your day. One more time. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second. Let the breath out slowly, relaxing your entire body. Now just breathe slowly and normally. On the end breath, start counting one. On the out-breath, two. Continue to do this for one minute.
next episode is episode 18 and it will be released next Wednesday. Thank you again for joining me today and please let me know how we did. Remember, keep calm, taper slowly, and take care of yourself. I'll see you next time.